welcome to part two, part two of part two, the second coming of episode 11 of Uncommon Conversations. Uh, my name is Jordan Farmer. My guest today is Zach Michelson, and we are going to be going into a discussion about history and economics and finance. He is here. I think this will work. I don't know what I don't know why it's not working no There we go. Finally. There okay. we go. After some technical issues. Thank you. Instagram being very, uh, yeah. very temperamental today. Yeah, exactly. Um, so what were you, sorry, where were you? No, I mean, you know, what, what we were saying about, you know, how it's, it's, it's no win sometimes, you know, with, uh, with foreign policy and you have to be careful about, you know, to what extent uh, you want to intervene. Um, and, you know, not only is that relevant in, you know, in Central America and South America, but you know, it's it's a situation that uh, is is what's in the headlines right now with with Afghanistan of mm -hmm. you know a, a twenty year failed experiment with with nation building that um, you know we see through the U.S. lens, but you have to remember it's been an international mission, um, you know, led led by NATO, right? If you if you go to Europe, they're not they're not talking about Biden at all. They're talking about did you know. This guy who's the former prime minister of Norway, you know, who's the secretary general of NATO. They're talking, you know, you know, they're talking about is his decision to pull out. No, no one's really talking about Joe Biden, you know, abroad. Mm -hmm. because, you know, we're we're one part of an international coalition. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I guess we always have the question: Are we going to do something different than our allies? But you know, this is not not exclusively a U.S. mission. But but in any event, you know, the uh, there are a lot of you know good questions. Um, for people to be asking again and learning the history about why nation building, you know, uh, doesn't work and why it ends in tears, right? Um, yeah. You know, this old quote from a general about um, uh, about how, uh, starting a war is easy; the hard part is ending one. Yeah. Right? And yeah. So, you know, that's that's often the problem, and you know, I I think kind of the problem is uh, you know they also say this thing about generals are always fighting the last war. Um, I think I think not just the generals. I think the American people has in mind this idea of, of a war, thinking of the ones that our grandfathers fought, like for instance, you know, like like World War Two, where against um, central where, government. Yeah, we're, we're just like where we win, and then like the Nazis like collapse, and all the German people agree that Nazism was wrong, and then they become like a great country now, you know. Like, yeah. and they were realized, right? So we have in mind this idea of like, well, sometimes countries become like total like fascist assholes, and then we just yeah. need to go in and like kill the bad guys, and then they're gonna be, oh, we're sorry, and we're all gonna be like, great no, country we're sorry, now, right? You know, like, <laughs> because like that's what we like, right yeah. or wrong, that's what we think the story of World War Two is, right? And keep in mind, keep in mind, we still have military bases in Japan and Germany, so it's not like we, <laughs> yeah. it's not yeah. like we had that victory where we bailed. We're still there, right? We're still there. <laughs> Exactly right. Um, right. But so we have this idea in mind, you know, um, right. And, and but also, you know, we've got the military base. Yeah, we have military bases like in, in Italy because we invaded there in Germany. But the idea is, is like, is, oh, but that's cool because they're like cool with it. And like, that's just like a cool place to get stationed, you know, like you get to like, you know, sip Aperol spritzes while you're stationed at the air base in Italy, you know, like that's that's how we. Have, so we just think, oh, OK, there's this idea that we'll just like you know, invade countries if, you know, they get taken over by assholes and then like, and then, and then it's just going to be like a resort air base one day and, you know, and then they're going to say that they're sorry and like set up like a nice democracy and become our allies and that kind of thing. So I guess like we, we think, you know, or have thought, oh, we'll just do that with like Afghanistan and Iraq and like Syria and like, we'll just like invade and then like kill some of the bad guys and then everyone's going to like, 
you know, what would it, you know, Rumsfeld League greet us with flowers and like, oh, thanks for killing the bad guys. Like, we're happy to be a democracy now and be like allies and, you know, set up a high tech sector and, you know, that kind of thing. And so we just think everyone's going to be like, gonna join NATO next year. <laughs> yeah, right. We think everybody's going to be like Japan, right? And, they, and they're like, mm-hmm. we're just going to like, you know, uh, nuke their cities, but then like say, you guys, you're sorry about that, right? Okay, all right. Start making some electronics. Yeah, people, and people need a, for you a know, little like, perspective. You had Nazi Germany, the Third Reich, which is just like in in a bad evil sense, but the mightiest version of Germany that's existed in a long time. They, you know, the most aggressive, the most world, you know, conquering. And Japan, imperialist Japan. So they they were not just nations. They were trying to be super nations. They were trying to take over the world in some ways or or their region. So it was was not a faction of tribes. You know, yeah, exactly right. They right. were trying to turn into something. It was something that had been that had been formed into maybe too much of a nation, too nationalized. Right. right. You yeah, know, exactly. in that right. sense, in the bad sense of nationalization. I, I think so, yeah, yeah. We're, we're 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 seeing this now that um, for for as, as much of a tragedy as in Afghanistan right now, and you know, I think about this, you know, exactly in that metaphor. You know, suppose we'd gone into Germany and licked the Nazis and occupied until 1965. When we agreed, all right, hey, listen, we've been here from just occupying Germany from 45 to 65. I guess it's time for us to bring home. And then the moment we did in 1965, they became Nazi again, right? Like, yeah, what yeah. would we have done? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I mean, that's kind of the situation that we're seeing here, right? And, mm-hmm. and it, it shows that, you know, like, it's just we, you know, went into and, and I think critically continued to occupy Afghanistan because of this model of, like, Nazi Germany, imperialist Japan, that if we just like kill the bad guys and occupy and nation build for a little while, then it's going to be a happy story in the end. And, yeah. uh, and that's, that's not the case. That's not what happened in Afghanistan. Not, not what was ever going to happen. We can occupy for another 20 years and they're not going to turn into like modern day Japan or Germany. You know, it's just not the same country. Right? I think, I think so. Like I have, I have a, a, a philosophy where yeah. like, cause it was Bush that got us involved in here. Yeah. Once the next president gets in, um, the moral approach is different when you're mid fight versus starting yeah. a fight. Yeah. Right. And once you've already, so like we were at a position where we had 3,500 troops there. And I think we hadn't had uh, a soldier casualty, an American sol- soldier casualty in like 18 months or something like that. So it was very much a low, a low uh, tension kind of an area. Right. And so my calculation would be at that point, where, you know, it costs money to keep this going and it does cost personnel, but yeah. it's not costing us a lot of lives. We could get some sort of financial compensation through taxing the the underlying economy there as it builds. Obviously, it has to exist in the first place. They don't really, they're not wealthy people. Um, and the main issue was trying to create a nation instead of maybe seven little teeny tiny nations yeah. that are just forced to exist in their own little sections that that fundamental like trying to make one thing out of that region instead of letting it be the many things that yeah, it was yeah. maybe you could have come up to some sort of a, a a a nicer ending there i'm always trying to like find the the potential routes in which something could work because um as with welfare and foreign policy there's often this sort of all or nothing mentality whereas yeah. it's usually the details that determine the outcome or at least slightly more nuanced you know aspects yeah. of it like the germany japan thing and the and the, the afghanistan thing like um we didn't create a nation on the one hand we were just trying to keep them from taking over the world and, and being offensive sure. against us and we are trying to create a nation here so it's like it's not even about military interventionism it's trying to make something that it isn't you know right. to a and certain this, degree this is, this is what has been has been discussed about the Afghan conflict for and that that and I like Biden's years, speech about something. there was never going to be a good time to pull out like Biden's speech really like compelled me to see see that it was a well reasoned decision to pull out and to to take the bullet so to speak on the the bad PR that he's getting for right. this decision because there How was never going to be a good time and ultimately we are. If you don't like, if you didn't think we had any business there in the first place, I guess eventually we just have to leave and let it be. Oh, yeah, which which is right. Let it not exactly. be our business. 
because there was never going to be a military solution to this, which is, which is the conclusion that the U.S. military, that NATO, that all the nations came to, you know, approximately 10 years ago, right? We hit the peak uh, of, of troop presence there in 2011, right? Troop, troop presence has been like, it's been like a pyramid, right? It, straight, you know, straight up for 10 years from 2001 to 2011, and then straight down. So it just so happens that Biden happens to be president 10 years following you know, the peak. But they started a drawdown that was intended to last for a decade starting in 2011. Um, I mean, the, the only potential for that changing was, you know, Trump wanted to say, screw that timeline. I, I, I'm getting all the troops out right now. Um, they need to be out in the next six weeks. And then the general said, no, 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 you, you don't want to just pull them out immediately. The nation's going to collapse. That would not be good. Now, why, then, so, so, you, so I'm guessing there was it. some place where the NATO plan to draw down and pull out ultimately was was negotiated and, and, and talked about. Why is yeah, it that a part of the discussion on, on the more national level? Why is it the United States outlets don't talk about I know, those kinds of exactly. plans? Because that would, and, and again, this gets to, I kind of am going to answer my own question here. Yeah. If we're not fighting over stupid stuff, then we actually right. solve problems. Yeah, so exactly. I guess maybe that, because like yeah, I don't exactly. understand why you wouldn't talk about this having been a long-term plan. So it's not even about right. Obama exactly. or Trump or like the exact timeline. It's like this is this broader move that we're making right. with international partners, and it's just been a cooperative thing. It's not us saying we're going to do our own thing over here. And like right. that, it would be like if it changes they, the conception of it entirely. Exactly. It would be like if they told you, you know, if the only thing you heard about World War II was the United States fighting Germany. You're like, well, there, Germany there was just there chilling, and then the United States came in and just started mowing us down. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, exactly, right. So it was not, World War II was not United States versus Germany. The occupation of Europe following World War II was not only the United States. Yes, we, we did have an, a, you know, a role in it. Uh, and yes, it is probably overstated in American schools how much America was important, you know, and we probably underappreciate the role of like Russia. Well, and as like Americans, that. I think we're, it's, it's our right, right to appreciate our role yeah. in it maybe yeah. more than the other ones, but yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Like American centrism is, is on both sides, thinking America yeah. was uniquely evil or uniquely great right. amongst peoples. And it's like, we're all just, there's systems and right. philosophies and econ economies and all that stuff that is better and worse, but ultimately it's just we're all people and nations are both evil and good, just as yeah. humans are. And, exactly. Yeah. Right. Look, US, US troop presence in Afghanistan is what, like 37, 40%, something like that. I haven't seen the number recently. So it's important. It's, it's the largest of any of the coalition members. But to say that this is simply you know, a U.S. decision, or this is Joe Biden. It's it's not. It was decided long before. It was decided before Trump. You know, it was, mm. and it was not decided by the U.S. because it was not a U.S. decision. It was an international coalition that ultimately decided correctly that there was not going to be a military answer to Afghanistan for the reasons that you stated. You know, correctly there that well, there was a military component that ultimately. The task of armies is not to build nations. It's not to set up democracies. It's not to feed people. And, you know, that largely what the mission was turning into was humanitarian. It was, you know, setting up political institutions, setting up, you know, uh, infrastructure, um, things that armies aren't originally designed to do. Right. And mm -hmm. uh, and, and that while the mission of building Afghanistan, helping the Afghan people wouldn't end whether it should be done with guns and bombs that maybe that should right um yeah. and then, you know it comes back to this point not all problems are solved with a gun and you know we we realized 10 years ago with afghanistan a lot of the problems here in afghanistan are not problems that can be solved with a gun some of them are and some of them will need to be indefinitely and there are security issues and militaries can help with that um but you know increasingly there we said you know for a nation's own security we need to help train them to be able to maintain their own security. So we're not going to leave right away, but and that seemed to have not worked at all. Yeah, no, right, exactly. And and so they had three, I think, three hundred thousand troops and billions and dollars of our equipment, right. and now right. it's in the hands of the Taliban. Yeah, exactly right. Um, yeah, right. So I mean, this 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 does you know sort of begin to to raise a question of like you know um, of you know a, a, a nation's got to you know defend its own liberties and you know at, at some point right and so it raises these questions of you know uh were you know is it about 
you know, recriminations of, you know, did we pull out too fast? Did we train them enough? Did we invest enough in it? Versus at some point, like, you know, other nations, you know, are just gonna, they're gonna fight the, you know, if this were in the United States, the United States would, would defend it. You know, Amer American citizens would, I think, you know, take arms and defend themselves, right? If they were defending yeah. their own wives and daughters, right? Yeah. You know, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think there there would be more people joining, you know, joining the National Guard or whatever, um, you know, if, if it was, you know, about, uh, you know, defending rights at, at home. And, um, you know, I, I uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not clear, you know, totally why in some nations, um, you know, it works that, that they develop uh, law and order and security and, and in others not. I think that there's there's this component of, um, you know, of, of, the, of the culture, of the concept of what they want the law and order to be. And, and then I think, you know, a significant portion of, you know, the young men of Afghanistan want the law and order to be Sharia law and order, and they, you know, they, the, the very same people who in the United States might be joining the National Guard, you know, are there are joining the Taliban is the problem, right? Because yeah. ideologically, that's that's the law and order that they want. You know, apparently somebody, you know, who's fighting them for, you know, these are Afghan men also who are who are the Taliban, and so you know, the problem, that, you know, that we have, you know, same same thing, uh, you know, in. Iran or something like that, for instance, you know, many Iranians do not approve of their government at all. And, you mm -hmm. know, do not want them to be, you know, uh, highly religious and conservative and all of that. And, you know, I mean, sometimes it just takes the most aggressive or sometimes it is just the most aggressive sub faction of a society yeah. that ultimately takes control because it's and I right. think part of it is um, the strength of your beliefs and your convictions as it relates to anything as a human yeah. being will determine your your resolve in, in pursuing it. Like if yeah. you if you don't really like if you and the tribe next to you don't really have anything in common, you guys don't really like have any kind of like mission together or sort of story about the way you guys came in you know, came yeah. into exist at this stage. Like like us in Mexico, right? There's like like we have certain certain things that we've decided to agree upon. We trade, we have certain military relationships. But the idea that like we're just going to join up and be a new country with Mexico is an, almost an insane concept, right? Like yeah. th 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 we would just be like, now we are one tomorrow, right? That just would yeah. never happen. And right. so I think unless you have that shared story and certain things like religion can then cross those cultures. Yeah. Um, and then ultimately uh, what we saw was a mixture of, of um, certain values uh and philosophies, uh, so like Greek and Roman philosophies and stuff yeah. like that, kind of merging yeah. with the modern pagan Christian sort of uh, values and yeah. nation and everything that, that basically, so human beings are, are full of potential, some of yeah. which is good, some of which is bad, and only under the right circumstances will the right next level basically peak out where you have civilization beyond individuals just acting as, you know, base humans, you know. You have yeah. to have have to have values and etiquette and traditions and all these kinds of things to tie people together. Uh, otherwise, like we're kind of splitting apart right now in the United States because we're losing that, you know, especially people of European descent. And uh, I'm not saying this should really change. I just think we need to reframe our, our view of America uh, as Americans all collectively. But many people uh, of European descent have no ties to tradition or value of tradition in any way, because we're very much as Americans, a new thing here we don't tie ourselves back to europe or anything like that so unless we develop closer ties now here we're gonna i think we're gonna be under threat of um of, of splitting apart of not having things yeah. ties. I, mean, I don't think we're that. super I, I close know, but we're getting there i, I mean I, I know a lot of people of european descent where their uh their traditions associated with their you know original uh, home country, you know, where their ancestors came from is still pretty, pretty strong for them. You know, I think, so I, I mean, I live in the New York, New Jersey area and like, for instance, you know, like in the Italian community, right? Like a lot of the Italian traditions are still, you know, pretty important in people's lives. I think, um, you know, I, I see it also, um, you know, in the, in the Jewish communities or something like that, you know, keeping a lot of those, you know, original European, uh, 
uh, traditions. Um, and, uh, you know, well, I, I feel like I, it's I, kind I, of I know been, of, it's know, been diluted down for, into like the good of it is food and sharing and the bad of it is our evil history of war and imperialism. <laughs> like it, <laughs> Like it's, you know, it's, it's, I don't know, maybe I phrase that too exclusively. It's just because I'm white. I was sort of wanting to comment on my own, like, lack of a, lack of a connection to that. And it's partially because I'm like seven well, different types of white too. I'm from like yeah. seven different European nations. So it's like, I don't have a real strong tie to any one of them. A little bit Italian, a little bit yeah, England, have, but for the most part, I mean, I think, it's a mix. You know, I, I think a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the folks who are, are from the South, even, you know, they might just, you know, kind of think of themselves as, as just white. Whether they realize it or not, you know, a lot of the things that are part of, um, you know, this uh, the right-wing Southern politics are things that culturally stretch back a thousand years in, into Europe. And really to the ancestors that they may or may not realize they have. Like, for instance, a lot of it is directly descended from, from Scottish politics um mm -hmm. you know like for instance you see this the yellow don't tread on me flag well that's mm -hmm. this scottish flag um it's it's a oh, border okay. scott yeah it's a border scots flag that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years it's really back to um it's really back to the william wallace stuff right so no, okay. you know the the, the ideology um, i don't know much about william wallace and that that history of uh yeah well i mean you know, think of uh you know the 1995 movie braveheart Right. Yeah, oh, okay. so, okay. right. So, um, you know, so so this this idea and really, you know, the very same sort of stuff that you'd see, you know, look at the comments of people, you know, who are like, you know, anti mask and anti vax or something like that. You would think if you grab some people from Scotland from the 1100s and then like put them under the mandate of like the English saying that they have to wear masks, it would be like the exact same response, yeah. right? You know, I'll never wear your English mask or something like that, right? You know, it's yeah. it's the exact same sort of cultural and political uh, ideology um, that really, the, the border Scots, and, and I've got border Scots in my family also, um, that the border Scots were, were really kind of always in this, um, this area where they were sort of sandwiched between two monarchies and really resented especially the english monarchy that they were fighting against because they did not identify as part of it so they were really kind of always anti-government and in this very rural landscape where um it was all about like you know defending your territory not only sort of from from the english but because there were sort of these um you know multiple clans and you know ambiguous fences you know dating back hundreds of years uh it was really sort of a culture of you know defend your territory um so it was you know heavily armed farmers who you know did not take lightly to an offense to their honor right um which became the very same culture of the south through the 17 and 1800s you know like you hear the hatfields and mccoys and you know all that sort of culture um mm -hmm. It's not for nothing that those very same people, the Hatfields and McCoys, they are directly descended of, you know, they, these are Scottish and Irish names. They are like directly descended from these very same people who came from these countries where they wanted to resist the tyrannical power of the English monarchy, right? Mm -hmm. And this idea of resisting the tyranny of power and, you know, I look out for number one. And I look out for my family. Don't touch my gun. I'm defending my homestead, and government better stay off of it. Is is a story that has gone back a thousand years, you know, whether they realize they're not in their own families. And a lot of people do. And there's a, a reason why you know southern southerners will talk about heritage and that sort of thing, and and that their their heritage is not only going back to. Uh, to the 1800s, but to the 1200s and that kind of thing, it, when you think about this exact, you know, sort of political uh, ideology. So, um, you know, I, I think while, uh, while there are some whites, you know, who, you know, still, uh, you know, make Sunday Italian sauce with their grandma or something like that, and hold on to that Italian tradition. Um, there are other, like, even, you know, kind of political traditions that whites in America are holding on to from the old world, from uh, Scotland and England and those areas that that are still very relevant in American politics a thousand years later.
Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool to tie that, tie that deep of a perspective. Yeah. And it makes sense too, that like, especially well, they, they um, don't need to until I mean, recently, culture is so much of what de determines your, like now we're is, exposed yeah. to everyone. So you get disruption in like your sort of tradition and everything to a much greater degree. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, it would make I, sense I wonder whether those people with, with, the, with the don't tread on me flag, whether, whether they know, I, I'm sure many of them do know the cultural history there. You know, I, I wonder how many of them are sort of specifically tying it to, you know, this is the same flag that my great, 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 great grandfather flew when he was, you know, living on the yeah. border in Scotland. If I had so, to guess, it's probably a huge, uh, significant minority of them. <laughs> right, right. And, and, <laughs> Most yeah, of them and, are and, probably, like, thinking in a five-year time frame, not a 500-year yeah, right. time frame. Right. And yet, I would say, whether they're aware of it or not, it's, it's not a coincidence that the culture was passed down through generations. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, when the people same, are recognizing that it's a part of their whole, like, sort of... Are there, are there similar versions of that uh, for other parts of the country, maybe the more northern parts of the United States, like the yeah, industrial sure. side? Like, where, where would that have come from, or what was the, the parallel there? And kind of what you're talking about is the difference between rural and city people. You know, rural people, you have to rely on yourself because there's no one there to help you. And yeah. city people, you know... If you're in if you're in the good area of town, there's no homeless, so you don't worry about it. Yeah. So it's like not your problem. And then well, if it, if very, you're in the bad area of town, all the homeless people are there, and it's way people. too much to handle. So you have to very like true. create these broader systems to handle the the, it, the it, bigger right. collection of issues. Absolutely. And where we were talking about, you know, that problems are prisoners' dilemma situations, um, and that prisoners' dilemma is about, you know, am I going to just think about myself? potentially at the cost of others or not. And then you mentioned there the rural thing versus urban relating a lot to whether you think self-reliantly self-dependent or not that, you know, and how the self-reliant self-dependence, I don't want government a part of it is, is part of a philosophy that goes back, you know, a thousand years or something like that in, in many people's families. Um, that therefore, if that's sort of part of your culture that you might very well answer the prisoner's dilemma question, like, defect i'm looking out for me i don't care about you know others that's not my job stay off my land etc cetera, etc cetera. don't tread on me you know i'll defect you know sure like that's not my problem because you know it, you're in this rural area you look out for number one you your family has been in a rural area defending its homestead for a thousand years that's what you do you know whereas exactly as, as you point out um you know people who are in in urban areas cities would collapse if everybody was looking out for number one, right? It, it would all, all descend into chaos if we weren't looking out for each other in, in a dense area. You I, know, think I mean, I, not I, to I be, can tell not you from experience, be. you know, people have this idea, if you're from the farms or something, they have this idea that, uh, that New York City is, is real cutthroat. Let, let me tell you, walk down a crowded New York City, uh, city street, you know, at rush hour or something like that, like you've seen on the news and it's all, you know, packed with people or something like that. Watch one person trip and the entire street will stop and be picking them up and making sure that they're okay and that kind of thing. Because if we, we all know that we need to function that way. New York City knows you can't just like, you know, ignore when somebody trips and it will all literally trample over them, right? We know we all have to care about each other and look out for each other or, or people will die, right? We yeah. can't just ignore the interests of other people. And so... You know, I can say as somebody who's, who's lived in New York City, New York City area for, for 20 years, it is not at all that image of, you know, a city where nobody cares about each other. In fact, it is a city where everybody knows if we don't care about each other, we're all going to die. Yeah. So I think it's it's so uh, to push back a little bit on the way you framed the, the distinction there. I don't see it as so I, what I see is the that these two teams, essentially, or these two sort of conceptions of the world to a degree operating with different values that are interrelated, but ultimately different, different planes. So one is yeah. compassion. That's the one you're talking about. You're very yeah. much on that team. You could tell, I could tell from the way you talk about your worldview and your philosophy, you're very much on that compassion side. The other side is duty, right? Yeah. And it's what you have. The personal responsibility is the way the conservatives frame it, but it's very much duty. You yeah. have some sort of role to play yourself. And the thing is like, if people are helping you and you're taking advantage of that help, you're not being compassionate. 
So a yeah. lack of personal duty is a lack of compassion. And on the other side of it, if you aren't being compassionate, if you aren't helping your fellow man, you're not doing your duty as another human being because it's, I think part of what we, part of what gives the meaning to our life is our creative and productive capacity and being productive for others and producing yeah. things for others is very much what gives us value in our life. So it's, so, I think that's a way of putting it. so, no, it so it's not compassion versus no compassion and it's not personal responsibility versus no re personal responsibility. Big yeah. city people are very ambitious and very conscientious. You, yeah. you in particular are a great example of this very accomplished a professor. You've worked hard. You've been planning and piecing parts of your life together for years to culminate into being a professor. Like, so you obviously aren't lacking for the duty side of it in terms of handling your own stuff. And on the other side of it, there are lots of compassionate people who simply overvalue the duty and fail to recognize the value of the compassion. And I think yeah. there's the danger of doing it the other way, where it's no, I, you're, I you're recognizing that's, that's the compassion but failing to, to see that, that it's about duty, not a lack of compassion. It's yeah, about you know, something else, not a lack of the thing. There's one of my colleagues at NYU who's explored this a lot, and I think he'd really enjoy his books, Jonathan Haidt. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. H-A-I-D-T. -H um, and, uh, you know, that's you know, excellent work on, on uh, exploring, you know, exactly what you said, that, um, that it's not as simple as there being one dimension of values and then saying, like, you know, one side has it and the other side doesn't. It's, it's more about that there are, there's Very an intersection good. of values. Yeah, well, and really, you know, I think as, as you were saying, there, there are diff different dimensions of values. And it's, it's more about that people on, you know, of one political leaning might have, you know, more emphasis on this value and less on that one. Whereas people on the other end are more on this value and less, you know, on, on that one. Um, and I think, you know, uh, you know, like for instance, Jonathan Haidt talks, talks a lot about, um, you know, that stuff. And it's really, really fascinating stuff. I mean, he, he explains yeah, I've, a lot. I've been a big fan of his work. I think he, I, uh, unfortunately I diverged from him very early on in, in understanding his worldview because uh, he believed, and I understand the importance of, of adopting the language of yep. maybe the modern leftist le lexicon to try to, to be able to speak to them more effectively. But I also saw very, I was sort of on the Jordan Peterson side of it where I saw the danger in giving into the language because we use language to express and manipulate ideas. So to a certain degree, who controls the language can determine the, the uh, like sophisticated minds can work around it, but who determines the language can determine the frame of thinking. And there's danger. Well, I, some I, danger I, I think there. actually like his most recent book is actually not about this particular topic that we're talking, we're talking about before, but it is about what you're saying there. And he's actually agreeing with you. Um, oh, okay. And so you, you might want to check that out because he's... That's good to know. <laughs> yeah, because he, he's actually, he wrote a, a, his most recent book about um, pushing back against, um, was it, he, the book is called The Coddling of the American Mind. And yeah. the, the, you know, the title kind of says it there, and, right? And about pushing back against, you know, uh, I think something that, you know, that... Um, folks you know on the right are summarizing as like you know being too pc in society or something like that and they I think, forget that 20 years ago pc was about right wingers yeah right well so so i think um you know height is is exploring you know the areas where where that is uh where where it goes to the extent of coddling and it's and it's detrimental um you know so um there's you know, there's areas so where. Maybe, so did I misunderstand his initial point, or did he change I, I, his? I think definition? you. I think you might have, because you know, I mean, I think the, you know, I think the gist of of what you know you might be saying, you know, with, uh, you know, now with um, uh, coddling and with political correctness is is that while while originally, um, yeah, the, the political correctness was um, was about saying. Um, you know, I suppose I don't have to use, you know, like if you want to be called, you know, something, cause that's what you call your people. And I just happen to have made up a name for your people. I suppose I can use your name if that's your name for yourselves rather than my name, you know, like, so you say, all right, fine. You know, like we've always been calling you this name and you, you find that name offensive and, 
you call yourselves this, you know, like, uh, you know, so I mean, you can imagine, you know, like, if we had a different name for Boston and people from Boston said, that's, that's not our name. We call it's ourselves. It's actually McCoy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He said, you stop calling us Boston. We don't call ourselves Boston. We call ourselves McCoy. Like, why don't you call us that? You know, like, yeah. uh, it's so fun. Japan so is an fun. example of that, right? Japan calls itself something other than the word Japan. Yeah, yeah right. Well, I mean, what it is. sort of more, you know, more apropos. There are some names for black people that, uh, that we've come to realize they don't appreciate. Oh, okay, and, okay. You know, I, right. I was, I was and, on the and, wrong you know, plane of thinking here, yeah. Right. M maybe I can call you the name you'd prefer to be called rather than that name <laughs> if you find that yeah. name to be offensive, right? So that, yeah. that kind of thing. So it's fine. It started there, and that's like sort of a reasonable step. Um, but then, you know, where it's gotten to the point where, where, uh, where as Hyde is pointing out, where it's coddling, uh, where we're saying, you know, that that's, uh, you know, it's too threatening to hear ideas or to have open discussions in classrooms or to have speakers at universities or, you know, to allow... It's, to when, it's when the value of compassion supersedes the value of truth right. and you stop okay, thinking. Right. And, and, and that, that uh, you know, it really his point is, is that raising our children to tell them that everything is threatening to them in the world and that they can't take on ideas, that they can't handle debates that that's a degree of coddling that is actually damaging to our kids. So, and that's, that's not the same as pushing back against having the right to call people racial slurs. Fine. We can grant that we don't need to call people racial slurs, but at the same time say free debate at universities should maybe be, you know, we don't need yeah. to say that that's, you know, something we can't handle, you know, or that's, that's too offensive, you know. Um, and and, then and that, that right there different. highlights the danger. So it's interesting because the conservative is always, conservatives are always being mocked about slippery slopes, right? Slippery slope arguments. But the left right. believes in a progressive future, right? So it's like they believe in pushing the dial forward, so to speak. But also, your you your fear mongering about us pushing the dial forward is is misplaced. And it's like. And so, and there, and there is legitimate criticisms of that conception of slippery slopes and what that actually means. So, yeah. like exactly. I, I, so I, I, there, I, would, I would to be down to, there, but um, I would encourage you to check out his new one. But uh, you know, but on the older, on the older stuff, I think really the the gist of it actually also agrees with, uh, with what you were saying, which is that um, that, it's that he thinks that um, that that liberals are the ones who would prefer to pose morality in one dimension and to say, you know, for instance, like the dimension is compassion for others and we have it and other people don't. Right. And his point is, well, in fact, conservatives of various cultures have a much more complex uh, notion of morality that involves dimensions that, that you don't, you know, even accept as, as dimensions of morality. And, and there's a debate to be had there, but, um, but it is not as simple as saying that, um, that they don't, you know, have the same, you know, morality as, as you. I mean, Hyde would summarize it as saying that uh, Western liberals are really concerned with the moral dimension called the harm principle, right? Mm -hmm. Of saying, mm -hmm. if it, you know, does it do harm to someone else, right? And so, they, they're going to be very concerned about things that do harm to someone else um, or that might potentially harm someone else. And then therefore say that that's the moral thing. Like, you know, like for instance, it, why are liberals, you know, mostly pro vaccine or something like that is it's going to boil down to saying, well, I might do harm to others by not being vaccinated. Therefore it takes on this, you know, this moral dimension. Right. Whereas for others, there are other moral dimensions, um, you know, uh, that that are maybe factoring into that decision, maybe factoring into numerous other ones um, that Hyde points out, you know, like in Eastern culture, there's respect for your elders or something like that. So in the Western liberal perspective, if we were asked, you know, some question where we had to compete, you know, respect for elders against harm principle, right? Western people, especially Western liberals would say, I'm just going to ask myself whether it, whether it does, you know, any harm to any others. And if it's not doing any harm to anyone, then there's nothing wrong with it. Whereas, you know, the particular, we could come up with a story where we say, you know, well, but if that's not respecting your elders, then maybe like, you know, in the Eastern tradition, that would be an immoral thing or something like that. You know? yeah. Or, or yeah. for instance, you know, like, as you noted, like, you know, religious beliefs or something like that, or, um, or, 
you know, the degree to which um, uh, things are, well, like, are so, sacred so or pure so your, or something like your that. Your values can help highlight what will offend your values, maybe in, in an accurate way. So, like the harm right. principle, the worst, the worst person outside of real, real evil that's universal. The worst person in that in that harm principle conception is a bully, someone who is yeah. just kind of beating on other people for the sake of the fun of it. That's like right. the worst, like right. the worst person. If it's the duty principle or whatever the equivalent of that would be, then it's the lazy bum who's just taking advantage of the system, right? That's the yeah. that's the the worst person in that particular value no, framework. Exactly. Very very good way. Yeah, that's that's exactly the idea, right? Is is that if if you have a, a moral dimension associated with duty then yes, you can absolutely come up with, uh, you know, with moral questions where, where people would have very different opinions based on it, depending on whether to them morality is, are you doing harm to someone or are you respecting your own duty or something like that, right? And yeah. there are certainly circumstances. And, and I think it's, it's the, the ones that are big in public debates right now where people, you know, come down on different sides of it is, they have a different concept of, of morality. I think, I think you're putting it well with that, with that duty principle. Um, you know, cause, cause there are, there are numerous other ones. Um, but, uh, maybe, and, maybe it's like harm and responsibility. Am I handling yeah, my responsibility? It's some, it, right. Something along those lines. Hyde points out that there are numerous ones, um, that, that are important to conservatives of, of various cultures. Um, like, uh, and, and I think even more, for instance, like, you know, conservatives in the Middle East or something like that. But but even in the U.S., like, to, to what extent, um, you know, things should be, like, sacred or pure or something like that. So, um, you know, like, in, in the U.S., we might encounter that with, like, flag burning or something like that, you know, is to some extent, you know, I, you know, is that is that free speech or is it, like, you know, desecrating something that's sacred, you know, um, so that's that's one moral dimension. But questions like that are even even more important in in some other countries where, you know, they have sacred buildings and sacred places and, sacred, you know, sacred institutions and sacred structures and, you know, all that kind of stuff um, that is less prevalent in, in sort of, you know, American culture. Um, but. You know, There's where, a lot of the a lot of the morality or the sort of things you're talking about that aren't really moral principles so much as cultural infusions and in sort of between the morality and the culture because there's a lot of things like uh i found that and maybe maybe this is cross-cultural so i guess it's something un biological underlying this but um curse words and bad language naughty yeah. language yeah. is is very much like I, I feel like it's it might be a universal cultural thing that it appears yeah. in every culture that there's these taboo words and whatever yeah. but um I've been curious about that, like where that sort of factors in, because there's not necessarily a ton of religious underpinnings for why there there would be. Well, if, if you read it, the, so. best, the best book on curse words was was written by Stephen Pinker, um, so uh, you can you can check out um, Pinker's uh, book. I, I don't want to cut off the feed; it's been a couple of years since I read it, but you can you can look it up. He's got this this great great. He he does he's got a lot of books about language and psychology and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, I've but, been a big uh, fan of his, um, of his political commentary. I've been, I've been exclusively an, an intellectual, so to speak, through the political lens. So it's very much like to the degree that they venture into that sphere is the degree to which I know about them at all, which yeah, is not fair yeah. to them or their work. It's just, that's the, that's the frame or the game I'm sort of in. So, um, yeah. but I, I'm a big fan of everything I've ever heard come out of Steven Pinker's mouth. So yeah, <laughs> He's a smart guy, and, and uh, um, I mean, I think if you've got like a a nerdy sense of humor, you might even find you know his, his books on you know on curse words to be to be pretty funny. I mean, he even had a book on grammar that made me laugh out loud in certain parts. Right. But, nice, know. nice. Yeah, I'll. Uh, I probably do have a nerdy sense of humor, so I, I don't know if I've if, if I've exercised it very much. But no, um, I but definitely yeah, look, have. Like the jokes the, that if, I only if, laugh if, at if, myself; if, those would be the nerdy ones. <laughs> yeah, I mean, very interested in the history of curse words, even and and that kind of stuff. And you know, I mean, I mean, he really, um, you know, it explores sort of the psychological concept that basically, you know, um. Most most of our uh, curse words are words for intimate bodily functions, and what why mm -hmm. is it? Why is it that they uh, you know that these are the things that we consider to be 
bad words and why does it you know add emphasis to speech why is that you know not something you want to bring up in certain places you know you know i mean i guess you know it's obviously sort of directly natural that you'd say well there's certain circumstances where you don't want to talk about intimate bodily functions because you wouldn't do those intimate bodily functions in front of these people so you don't want to talk about mm -hmm. doing that in front you know that sort of that thing that makes a lot of sense yeah, that makes right. a lot of sense that's cool yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely going to go check out that book. I've been curious. That's been something that, like, uh, when I was a teenager, I became a fan of Joe Rogan. And one of yeah. his things and his sticks was the curse word thing was, like, like he cusses. And, and I had people in my family who didn't like the cussing and so didn't like yeah. him, but I liked him. So I was, like, it got me on this question of, like, what is that? What is what is at the core of why, why some people are – because, like, me, when, I, when someone's being venomous towards me in their intent yeah. – then yeah. curse words really hurt. But when yeah, people sure. are just cursing in general, it, I don't even hear it most of the time. So I've yeah, right. always been very curious about, about right. as, why, as, why as that Pinker, would be. Right. As Pinker explores it, they have, they have numerous functions in, in speech, not, you know, um, you know, not all of which is to be offensive, most of which is not to be offensive, right? Um, you know, I mean, we can all think of them off the top of our heads. I mean, it's, you know, it's sometimes to, you know, to add emphasis uh you know to speech you know like you'd be like i right effing love now. that podcast right yeah, yeah yeah right um you know you know what the hell right you know like yeah. what the hell is more emphasis than what yeah. i don't mind cursing on my show so if you wanted to just go for it you yeah, can no. i just didn't well, know right. we well, have it kind of it's very very another, professional so, well, been... so there, there's another um aspect to to cursing is is, is uh conveying the level of formality or, or casualness right and that it injecting curse words is, is a way to make things more casual or you know mm -hmm. sort of more friendly or to you know sort of you know make us we're, we're kind of complicit in something we're in on something here you know for you know like agreeing you know to like i mean think about you know like if you're putting our hair down so to speak yeah right, if you're in a work setting right and you know and you're chatting with you know a co-worker about that meeting you know what does interjecting some curse words do, right? It it conveys that this is your this is your private opinion, right? This is not your formal opinion, you know. But yeah. you know, like if you if you walk out of the meeting and and you say, you know, I th I think we really need to you know rethink that. That's a more formal thing, you know. He's, that guy's fucking crazy, you know. That's that's a you know, you know. It's clear if I say to my co, he's fucking out of his mind, you know. Then <laughs> it's clear that that's not my formal statement on the meeting, you know. And, yeah. and like you know, so. There, are, I, but Pinker's point is is uh, is that that they're a necessary part of language. You know, they're an important part of language, and and uh, you know that uh, maybe the book was named Taboo or something. I don't know. It, it is it, yeah, the, the point is, is they're not just they're not just taboo words. They're you know a core part of language, and and in, in many cases, you know, some of the most uh, some of the most used words in in every language. You know? But uh, you know. Yeah, there's a joke. Um, this guy who's like a business motivational dude on YouTube or whatever, uh, Dan Pena. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he just jokes about like in behind closed doors when the camera's off, like a lot of these people just cuss all the time. Yeah. And I'm like, like I I don't cuss when it's not necessary, but I definitely yeah. cuss in my everyday life over mundane situations. It's it's a very normal thing for me well, to do. And, and look, um, if you haven't seen it, I mean, obviously George Carlin's classic routine about the, the seven words you can't say on television right yeah. that's, uh, that's obviously one of the which which ultimately went to the supreme court over the stand-up routine um <laughs> but uh but i mean it's it's one of the best stand-up routines of all time um so it's so certainly worth looking it up on youtube now that's that's how you know you've achieved a unique once ever type of art is when it goes to the supreme court <laughs> nas x is trying to trying to trying to beat him i think a little bit i'm just kidding but it, that was that was an interesting point, the Nas X video, because uh, I saw conservatives talking about censoring art, like government censoring art, and I yeah. saw left wingers defending the rights of corporations, and I was just yeah. like, "What world am I standing in right now?" <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and I understand the nuances of the discussions, not so much from the right. I think it was just emotional and yeah. uh, concern for children, maybe. Um, yeah. But on the left wing, it was very much, you know, a, a technical thing. But um, I just thought I, I remember being in that moment and just being like, how do I work with this? <laughs> well, right. I mean, that's that's another, you know, like we were just saying there about the dimensions of, of morality, about to what extent is morality about 
uh, sacredness and to what extent is it about, you know, harm and uh, protection and, um, you know, and what constitutes harm, um, you know, is, um, is it harm to be, you know, exposed to, um, you know, sexually suggestive dancing, right? But, you know, if, yeah. if we come down on different sides of that debate. Um, Dra drag you know, queen story hour. <laughs> yeah, right. right, right. Yeah, well, Sexu right. Sexualized so, right? story I'm going to think, you know, I think if, if we did surveys, you know, I'm going to think, um, I think probably the majority of people are going to be okay with adults being exposed to sexually suggestive dancing. You, you'd get fewer people te agreeing uh, teenagers, and I think the majority of people would not be okay with young children being exposed to it, right? Yeah. But, yeah, what about, you know, cross-dressing, right? Non-sexually suggestive cross-dressing, right? Mm -hmm. For sure, like 50 years ago, like 90% of America would have said that, that that's not okay, right? But I think, yeah. you know, right right now, you know, with, with the morality, I think probably you say that's a decline in the loading on what exactly is sacred and an increase in asking, is it really doing any harm to anybody? You know, and, and so that now, you know, RuPaul's Drag Race is, you know, something that can air in, in prime time. And, uh, you know, I think the majority of parents in America are going to say, okay, seeing a man in a costume is not going to, you know, do, yeah. do my family. It's not, it's not sexual. They're not doing anything sexual. It's a man in a dress with makeup on, which is not sort of technically different than a clown or sometimes, any other. Makeup, some, you know? Because it's modeling, you know, maybe sometimes they get a little suggestive or low cut tops or whatever. I definitely wouldn't want, you know, my eight-year-old watching RuPaul's Drag Race show, just more so for their mind than anything else. Yeah, like, what are you yeah. doing watch, spending your time watching this show? Like, yeah, it's yeah, more yeah, so yeah. an anti-reality TV show thing than a than a drag queen thing. But um, yeah, exactly. I, I definitely well, think, so like, to highlight these examples, like, uh, I was talking to a guy about issues with gay pride and guys being yeah. out in public, you know, yeah. nude basically yeah. and showing their stuff like around families yeah. and children like yeah. to what degree is that public indecency or is that you know rightful yeah. um, self-expression and um I, I was it was funny because i got to call right wingers snowflakes and say yeah. they were being triggered so i felt very proud of myself but um well, we were talking it's, about it's, uh, a music it's generally true that um the the extent to which some people are uh oversensitive or triggered it is on both sides there you know yeah. there um as as we were talking about before and jonathan hype was pointing out for sure there are people acting you know uh as though everything is super triggering and sensitive to them you know on the left but yeah. uh but there well, are definitely examples the right of people was, on the right um, that are being super rapper, yeah. have you heard of tom mcdonald the rapper uh I probably I should have. I don't know. Okay. You've probably that. seen some of his music. I don't. He's one of those guys. Like he, he. You've definitely seen something from him. Probably. Anyways, he had a a, a video called Snowflake. So he was talking about, and he's he's a moderate ish, um, and he was talking about how both sides can get triggered. And he had Blair White in his music video, who is a transgender con conservative ish libertarian, yeah. but yeah. on the right, known to be on the right. So as a traitor to transgender people, the left doesn't like her. And because she's transgender, the right doesn't like her. So she's like this polarizing figure. And yeah. so we were talking about the fact that she was in the music video yeah. and they were trying to, trying to, they didn't get to the details and I pressed them and they didn't have any arguments, but yeah. they were trying to say there was something wrong about her being in the music video or the way in which she was in the music video in any way. And I was yeah. trying to get down to get down to it. And I was like, what, yeah. What is it? So we definitely like, it's not like I, I, often I react to people that are concerned with the trans issues or these various hyper compassionate issues personally, meaning like, I don't have any issue with these, uh, with these people. So please don't like speak about it as if a whole bunch or sure. me, you know, on the yeah. right sometimes as being anti-trans. Like I really, it, it sure. makes, it, it, it hurts me. Cause I'm like, I know I love these people. I know I, I have a heart for these people. I care about these people. I want them to live their best life. So it, there's no yeah. animus. So I take offense to that to some degree, but yeah. um, it's not like it's not a real thing either. It's not like racists yeah. aren't a real thing either. Like that, like these issues are real. Those people are real to a degree. I just think we should have universal disarmament in terms of like the normal political temperature. And then yeah. when someone shows themselves to be an extremist, 
if you can keep your calm, keep your calm. But if not, you know, I understand that's life. But well, but the sure. first position should be that you know cool temperature. I think so. Yeah. And uh, yeah. sometimes right wingers get triggered. <laughs> that was my only point with that True. story. True. My trainees on both sides. Happens on both sides. Absolutely. We're transgender folks or the LGBTQ plus community, whatever. And what's interesting about that is uh, you talked about like the racial thing, like. You had the move away from the N word and the and the close version of the N word, and then you have black versus African American. Yeah. And I've been called a Neanderthal for using the term black when some of my friends prefer the term black and other ones don't. And I'm nice enough and agreeable enough to be flexible enough to say I'll use whatever words you want. But if yeah. I'm talking in general, yeah, and using either, either and, and it's, no one's offended by African. Well, some people are offended by African American slightly, but not not really. It's mostly an intellectual thing. Um, but uh, if you're offended, like by the word black or whatever, but other black friends of mine don't, and I'm in the public yeah, sure. sphere, like you have to accommodate that. Now, you know, at some stage, maybe old people shouldn't be using the word Negro anymore. But <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, there's there's interesting stages to this, you know, this sort of concept, because there's the people that settle on not being offended by the word black. And then there's people that are offended by it. And it's where do you go with that kind of a thing? So you were talking about that earlier. So I thought that was yeah, that'd yeah. an interesting yeah. sort of example of where do you go with it? You know, it's a good point. And, and I think um, I think you're 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 latching on to the to the right points about that people have. You know different different dimensions of morality and uh and in each of these questions um in in society today the especially the ones that result in a bit of a tug of war you know uh it, it matters a lot that people don't have you know the the same concepts of what of what principles are that um you know that some people might be first and foremost asking does it do any harm to anybody? And other people might be saying that's not the only question or maybe not even the first well, question. Yeah. yeah. That that basically, it's like on one hand, the, the collective question is what could we have done? And the individualist question is what could you have done? Yeah. And that and that's they're both important questions to ask, I guess. Like they're like my, my view is this nice as an individual. Yeah. It's up to you to push yourself forward as much as you possibly can. And then society can either push you down or lift you up. And ideally, yeah. if we get it dialed in right, it's lifting everybody up. And the so, ideal yeah. scenario is individuals being encouraged to propel their, their own, to, to encourage their own creative and productive capacity to exercise their individual mark on the world, whatever beautiful language you want to attribute to whatever that is. Yeah. Uh, so um, and, uh, but the system can work for you or work against you. And obviously, optimally, it has to work in favor of all of us. Yeah, exactly. Nice, nice way of putting it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And any questions that you still had lingering about uh, central banking and stuff before? before yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, the balance sheet question and interest rates. I'd like to touch on those two points. So what does the balance sheet mean when it's expanded? Uh, the, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, so the Federal Reserve, um, like we we're saying, uh, creates the money of the government, and we we're saying that um, that money is just a liability. It means so. So, what is the so what is the the other word with liability? So, like the dollar is the liability. What is the, is it the reserve? He was uh, so so. A balance sheet has both liabilities and assets, right? Okay, that, that was the word I was. Okay, yeah, asset. Right. Okay. So, liabilities and assets. So. Uh, the Federal Reserve's liabilities are money. That's what that's what our money is. Is the liabilities of the Federal Reserve. If you take out a dollar out of your wallet, it says Federal Reserve note at the top, which you know is to to tell you what it is, right? So the base money is Federal Reserve money. They they create the money, um, and then they hold they hold assets against uh, against those liabilities. Um, so the assets they hold are mostly, um, U S treasuries and mortgages, um, and, uh, and to some extent, some, some other types of 
loans and things like that, particularly that got created during the credit crisis and stuff. They had okay. special. So when they control. expand their balance sheet, they're printing new money and buying stuff, buying yeah, assets. 